Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar on faster drug discovery and optimization with physics-based computational methods. My name is Jennifer Newton and I'm the RSE content editor for Chemistry World. I'm here to introduce the webinar software, introduce the topic, and most importantly, introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Alexi Gerasuto. First of all, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us. We would love to hear from you during the webinar, so please use your GoToWebinar panel to interact with us because we really want you to get involved. It's entirely customizable, so feel free to pull the bits out that you need and organize it how you like. GoToWebinar is an interactive platform and you can submit questions for our speaker at any point by using the questions box in your GoToWebinar panel. It's usually somewhere near the bottom. Your questions are a really important part of the webinar experience. So please ask away and we will put them to our speaker at the end of today's presentation. So that's the webinar software, but what's the topic for today? Well, today we're going to learn how computational methods are being applied to drug design and lead optimization projects. We'll learn how physics-based methods like free energy perturbation can dramatically save time and money compared to traditional drug discovery methods. And we'll see examples of successful applications of these technologies to real drug discovery projects. Our partner for this webinar, of course, is Schrodinger. Schrodinger develops computational simulation software that allows users to leverage a deep understanding of physics, chemistry, and predictive modeling to accelerate innovation. Their industry-leading computational platform to accelerate drug discovery and materials design is deployed by leading biopharmaceutical and industrial companies, academic institutions, and government laboratories worldwide. We've worked with Schrodinger to find interesting topics, and they've also put us in touch with your speaker for today, who's an expert in this subject, Alexi Gerasuto. Alexi Gerasuto is an executive director of medicinal chemistry at Schrodinger, where he is responsible for leading several of the drug discovery projects. He is also involved in target selection and evaluation processes for shaping Schrodinger's drug discovery pipeline. I can see you've already had some questions in, so I'd like to remind you to pop your questions in the box at any point, and we will do our best to get through them after the presentation. That I think is probably quite enough from me, but just before I hand over, a little reminder that because this is an online webinar, if you miss any part of the presentation or just want to watch it again in your own time to pick up on details, we'll email everyone a link to the recording in a few days time, and it will be available on the Chemistry World website. And as a little thank you from us, you'll also receive a certificate of attendance. Now that's definitely enough from me, so I will hand over to Alexi. Alexi, thank you ever so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for a very kind introduction, and uh, thank you everyone for joining this webinar. So it's de definitely a great pleasure to, to be able to present uh, this work uh, at this webinar on uh, application of on this project which we have done within the drug discovery group at Schrodinger, applying Schrodinger FEP plus uh, technologies for the rapid uh, uh, the rapid progression of this program. So I will start with a quick uh, I will start with a quick introduction of the target for this project and then spend most of my time talking about application of ligand FEP for the quick uh, quick identification of novel chemical series and then their further optimization using residue protein mutation FEP in regards of their selectivity profile. So the target for this uh, program is V1. Uh, it is the kinase and it's also a gatekeeper of uh, G2M uh, cell cycle checkpoint. So by phosphorylating its uh, substrate CDK1, uh, V1, uh, V1 kinase prevents the cell progressing into the mitosis pri prior to repair of the DNA damage. So normal cell uh, cell uh, cells typically rely on the earlier checkpoints to repair the DNA damage, such as G1S. So they typically do that prior to the progression into the S phase where the replication occurs. In many cases, the cancer cells uh, have a defect in this uh, earlier checkpoint, the G1S checkpoint, and therefore they have to rely on the later on the later checkpoints for those DNA uh, damage repair. 
essentially, the G2M uh, cell cycle checkpoint serves as the last uh, line of defense for the cell uh, before it uh, progresses to the, to the mitosis. Uh, therefore, inhibition of E1 is an attractive strategy to drive cancer cell lines, but uh, while sparing the normal cells into the premature mitosis. That typically leads to the mitotic catastrophe and, uh, and death. When we started this project a few years ago, we were really inspired by the clinical data published for the V1 inhibitor ad adovacer tip uh, from AstraZeneca, showing uh, promising anti-cancer anti -cancer activity, in, especially in the setting of the ovarian cancer. So more recently, uh, in the middle of uh, last year, uh, they followed up with even more impressive data from phase two uterine serous carcinoma trial, further confirming the power of this uh, mechanism in the, set in the setting of uh, gynecological cancers. And that served as a, as, a, as a foundation for this compound to progress, and it's now in the phase three clinical trials uh, uh, in, in the clinic. So as I mentioned, when we started this program, AstraZeneca was the only uh, player in the clinical field with their compound AZD 1775 structure, which is, uh, is shown here. This is a diversity I mentioned earlier. By analyzing the publicly available data for this compound, we saw a clear opportunity to differentiate and develop a best-in-class uh, V1 inhibitor. In particular, as it relates to the, to the kinase selectivity, I would like to highlight equipotent binding for this compound for the V1 and also PLK1. So PLK1 is the, is, uh, it, it has been a popular target within the pharmaceutical industry with a number of compounds progressing in the clinical trials. But so far, none of them uh, yet, uh, yet uh, were successful in that setting and uh, got into the market space. So for the most uh, part, the, the compounds were falling out for the toxicity and very narrow therapeutic index uh, for, for this particular mechanism. So we thought that the dialing out PLK1, uh, as well as further cleaning up the kinase uh, selectivity profile, uh, we could uh, further improve the therapeutic index for the V1 mechanism itself. Another known liability for this compound is uh, time-dependent inhibition of uh, CYP3A4, and uh, this could be particularly problematic in the setting of uh, in, a, in, the, in the combination uh, setting. For example, combining this uh, V1 agents with uh, PARP1 uh, or PARP, PARP inhibitors. Since we started the program, this uh, this mechanism gained quite a bit of therapeutic momentum. There is a number of uh, new entrants into the into this v1, into the v1 mechanism field with uh, with compounds in the earlier uh, stages of clinical development even with this uh, new players in the field and the, the data available to us uh, publicly for for their for their compounds we remain uh, we remain confident that we developed a robust strategy for the differentiation and the discovery and development of the best in class v1 inhibitor for treatment of the gynecological cancers and solid tumors so when we started the project, we knew that we are a bit behind uh, AZD7075, which was already in the clinical trials. So we set up very ambitious goals in the early onset of the program. So we really needed a rapid identification of uh, structurally diverse novel chemotypes. So we had a high requirement uh, for the on-target potency on V1. As I mentioned earlier, uh, with our differentiation strategy, we required PLK1 selectivity from the, from the get-go of the project. And we'll be talking about the, the screening funnel we established to meet this criteria in silico prior, prior to progression of the compounds into the synthesis queue. This is just to put things in perspective. This is internal data we generated for two analogs of each of the series. Um, I would highlight the equipotent binding I mentioned here earlier, whether it's for competitor uh, for the other competitor compounds they can clean on the PLK1. So this is the broader um, kinome uh, selectivity generated at the DiscoverX uh, using the ScanMax uh, ScanMax set of kinases. So, and I'll be uh, we'll be looking at them quite a bit throughout the webinar. So to meet the 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 goals we set up for the program, uh, we heavily relied on a ligand FEP plus technology, which I would like to introduce uh, to introduce with this uh, short video. So in the nutshell, uh, free energy perturbation method is a fully is a physics-based method which allows for accurate prediction of binding affinity or potencies of small molecules when you're changing their their, lig their structure in silico. So this method that takes into the account all aspects of binding, the dynamics of the protein, the, the energetics of the water 
of the water networks as well the conformational aspects of the ligand. So in this very simple case, uh, we're just changing uh, one atom in silico, changing the hydrogen of the phenyl group into the chloro molecule uh, in, in the simulation. And as you can see, while this chlorine atom is growing uh, toward the toward the high, small hydrophobic pocket and replaces the high energy water in that location, that leads to the increase in uh, in free energy of binding or binding affinity, as as reflected by this delta delta G number of minus 0.7 kilocalories per mole. Just to put it in the perspective of uh, of easier to understand metrics, this is again of potency of about five fold. So this is very simple. This was very simple example where we just changing one atom at a time. So this technology can be applied for much bigger changes where the whole big R groups can be changed in silico for in, and the potency can be predicted for the for the other ligand. Also, interestingly, it is applicable for changes in the middle of the molecule. So you can essentially estimate the potency, the differences in the pot in the potencies or binding affinities changing the core of the molecule of the structure. One important aspect uh, which is also required in addition to the to this uh, simul to this perturbation which I showed you on a video which occurs in the complex lab in order to fully account for all of the all of the proper uh, energetics of this process this per this perturbation between two ligands also needs to occur in silica but in the solvent phase essentially in water so this allows to complete this thermodynamic cycle and essentially generate this uh, delta delta G or difference in the binding affinity of free energy of binding for, for two ligands. Typically, when we think about ligand FEP, uh, we're generally designing ligands with idea in mind to either maintain the potency of the highly potent reference ligand. In this case, let's say it's ligand one. So we either want to retain the potency or most in the most applications, we will be trying to design the ligands which are predicted uh, using this technology to gain uh, binding affinity. So we're typically looking for the large negative delta delta G values here. So this is important because once we start talking about the protein raised limitation FEP, that technology answers a little bit different question. Um, in 2017, uh, we published the paper showing that this technology is widely applicable to the large number of targets. Uh, we published data for the large number of ligands in that publication. And essentially, uh, we showed that if this method is appropriately deployed on the program, it, can, it accuracy can be approaching the accuracy of the experimental methods. So the expected accuracy of uh, ligand FMP is about one kilocalorie per mole as shown here. And again, to put it in the perspective of a more easily understandable metric, this is essentially somewhere within five to six fold of experimental values. So since 2017, we expanded uh, the domain of applicability of this method. So we now applied it to the much larger number of targets and uh, did this FEP simulations on a much larger uh, set of ligands, working either with our partners or on the internal on the internal programs. So uh, once we fully uh, validated FEP technology on this program. And valid, the retrospective validation of FEP is the part which is important for the appropriate deployment of this uh, of this method on the program. Then we established uh, the efficient screening funnel, how we would go from the design of the compounds all the way to progression them into, into the synthesis Q and A synthesis. This is also very reflective of general workflow we uh, utilize within the drug discovery group uh, for the in the earlier stages of the program. So we very heavily rely on um, hand-drawn ideas, uh, which typically come from all of the medicinal chemists and computational chemists within the drug discovery group. We uh, capitalize on the live design uh, soft or live design platform, which uh, Schrodinger also uh, develops. And this uh, database allows us to, in, in the live format, to design all of the ideas and keep them in the same place, regardless where we are geographically. So very powerful tool which allows us to collect ideas on the program, even from the people who are not necessarily uh, involved directly as in the project teams. So in addition to these hand-drawn ideas, uh, we supplement them with a large uh, scale enumerations. Those could be coming from several technologies we developed uh, within Schrodinger, such as Pathfinder or other designer. So from this pool of ideas, we apply different, uh, different filters as well as different MPO methods to really narrow down 
exciting ideas to put them into the FFP simulations. In this case, FFP simulations on the V1, which is on target. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the second big goal for us was to make sure that we move compounds in the synthesis queue where we have confidence that we will be able to improve PLK1 selectivity as well. So those were essentially two big filters in, the, in this funnel, which allowed us then to select compounds for synthesis and push them in the synthesis queue for, uh, for, their, for, their, for, their, for their preparation. So we're really excited that uh, in a short seven months from the beginning of the program, we're able to identify uh, five structurally diverse chemotypes uh, with improved uh, PLK1 selectivity profile, essentially meeting the, the program goals. So this is just a little bit of a matrix, again, somewhat representative of, uh, actually very representative of what we typically see across the programs we run within the drug discovery group. So you can see that we, we generated close to 7 million ideas, but we are very selective in terms of which one of those will actually proceed into the FEP uh, simulation. From those predictions, we only selected 80 strategically designed compounds or compounds which were really, really interested uh, with their profiles, we observed through, through this funnel uh, to be made. So overall in this time, uh, time frame, uh, we synthesized 170 compounds. Some of them were uh, important references for enablement, for further enablement of the FEP. And as well, some of those were just uh, in, uh, in other enantiomeric from, from the mixtures we separated while we were making this um, design compounds. Again, we were able to accomplish uh, synthesis of the five novel chemotypes with fairly small number of compounds in a, in a fairly short period of time. Um, so this is the this is the data just to show you the 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 activity on the on target as well as the off target for the representative analog from each of those series. As you can see, we have the really good control over V1 potency from the beginning. So all of these compounds are essentially within two to three fold from the competitor molecules. And for the most part, we saw a significant improvement of the PLK1 selectivity profile, with one exception for, for series five. So one piece of the experimental data, which we were not quite ready uh, to wake up to another day, is uh, the data we were really patiently waiting for is the full uh, ScanMax uh, uh, kind of selectivity data from the, from the DiscoverX. And even though we were really successful um, using our established flow to meet the early program goals in, uh, in making uh, potent V1 inhibitors with a improved PLK1 selectivity profile very rapidly, efficiently we generated very promiscuous uh, kinase inhibitors. Nonetheless, uh, we did not uh, give up and we actually embraced this uh, tremendous amount of uh, negative data and went, and went back to the, to the drawing board trying to understand and rationalize it. So I'd like to give a huge kudos to my modeling colleagues on the project team who spent a tremendous amount of time analyzing and uh, trying to make sense of all this data. And uh, the one of the first uh, exercise which, uh, which they've done was doing the in-depth analysis of the residues around the binding site, trying to identify the residues which are concerned in a small subset of kinases represented in this, in this Discover X ScanMax set. So the first very interesting discovery which was made is that the ScanMax plots, which looked all very similar as a shotgun blast, are not, are not actually random. So there is a very interesting uh, qualitative observation which uh, we were able to make analyzing uh, a lot of that uh, negative data. I'll try to explain it using, using, this, uh, using this table. So we were able to identify a particular residue at, uh, at position X on the, on the, on the kinase, where depending on the amino acid uh, residue at this position. We saw different fingerprints in terms of the hits which were showing up in the ScanMax panels. So for example, uh, series one and series two, which was somewhat structurally related, had a fingerprint where not all of the kinases or random kinases we were showing up as hits. So when there was amino acid three or amino acid four at this position, those kinases typically were not showing up as hits. Whereas the those uh, red, uh, red uh, plots were Red dots on the scan max were heavily represented by kinases which had amino acid one or amino acid two at this position X. This was very interesting. What was also 
important that it wasn't random for the other series. So series four and five, you're somewhat structurally related as well, but we're very different from series one and series two. And in this case, the fingerprint changed. So in this case, amino acid residue three at this position of the kinase still didn't give us any many hits in the in the ScanMax panel, whereas amino acid four and two now completely swapped. So there was a uh, different fingerprints, and this, this was for the first time we really uh, uh, we were able to establish a qualitative uh, assessment of the large amount of negative data we got in the scan maps. So at this point, we were very comfortable with qualitative assessment, but uh, we decided to uh, take it one step uh, further and ask a question whether we can capture this more in the quantitative way. Because if that's possible, then one could imagine a strategy where we could uh, potentially use this quantitative strategy to help us optimize the selectivity profile for our chemical, chemical series. So this was the idea of using the single amino acid perturbations using protein residue mutation FEP. Um, to, to introduce this uh, technology, uh, I'll use this, uh, use this cartoons. The one thing to, to note here is that unlike the ligand uh, FEP, which I introduced earlier, in this case, we're actually keeping the ligand structure the same. So we are not changing the, the structure of the ligand in this uh, simulations, and rather we are changing one residue at the time in the context of the protein. So we're essentially asking a question, when we put the ligand in the context of the desired target, for example, in this V1, and we change one particular residue to the different amino acid, would that lead to the increase or decrease of uh, binding affinity of this particular ligand? So the way to think about it is we are using this single changed uh, protein as a surrogate for the off target. So what we really would like to see is the significant losses in potency when the ligand is uh, when the same ligand is simulated in two of those uh, in two of those proteins. You can imagine that in this case, uh, there is obviously 20 different amino acids. So this could become as a, as a number of simulations which needs to be done to be able to sample how the binding affinity of a particular ligand changes when you change it to the different amino acids. Um, again, uh, similarly to the ligand protein FEP, there is a, what's called as a solvent lag where this change of the protein structure needs to occur as well, it needs to occur in the, in the ligand-free environment to really close the cycle to produce this delta-delta G value of binding. And again, to kind of drive this message point that typically in this, for this particular application, which I'll be talking about, we would be thinking about uh, those changes where we would be looking for significant losses in potency, where we changing the residue in the V1 to some of the off targets uh, we were thinking about. So again, now this has changed. So this is a large uh, positive number, which is important for us. So the first question uh, which we really wanted to answer is if we can recapitulate relatively clean um, scan max plot, which we obtained ourselves for this uh, competitor series. And this table represents five different simulations in each of these columns. And what we're doing in each of those simulations, we're taking a ligand represented by from the series and we put it in the context of the V1 receptor, which is called wild type. And then we are changing the particular residue at this position X I described earlier to one of these amino acids, amino acid one to amino acid five. So the nature of this amino acids was determined based on the analysis. We did not feel that we need to run the simulations to, to all of the 20, 20 amino acids. Five of these amino acids gave us pretty good coverage based on our retrospective analysis they presented earlier. So each number here represents a delta PIC50 value and then this in the log units. So essentially what we have observed for both of the series, that when we do the simulations individually uh, from the wild type V1 to the, to the, to the surrogate uh, kinase, which could represent one of the hits in the, in the sub panel, we, we, we saw that there was at least, uh, there was a predicted loss of potency by at least one log unit, and then very rapidly get into much larger numbers. So such, such as two log units and even all the way to three and four. So with this one simple change of the residue, we were able to recapitulate and see that once we 
change the structure of E1 for these ligands to the amino acids, that leads to significant loss of predicted importance, which is fairly consistent with the, with the, with the ScanMax plots. The next important uh, experiment for us to do was actually take the, our own series or analogs representing those series and trying to recapitulate the plots which we observed ourselves. Again, we are doing very similar approach. So we're taking each of these ligands, putting them on V1 receptor and doing in silico transformation to the five of these amino acids, one at a time. And then we were very interested to see this result. So it was interesting that consistent with the clean series for the amino acid three and amino acid four at this position X, we were predicting significant losses of potency for this for this for this ligands similarly to the to the to the reference molecules i presented on the previous slide what was quite different here is for the amino acid 2 and the amino acid 5 the, there was there was predicted no loss in potency when we essentially changing the structure of the protein uh, in the with the with the presence of this ligand and the final piece of the pie and everything really came together and this was the final piece in this uh, puzzle of the analysis is when we really took a closer look at the particular nature and what the kinases represent. And we found out that there is a really good correlation between the predicted lack of loss of potency for inactivity, that it's that those kinases which have the amino acid two at this particular location, or amino acid five at this location, they essentially represented the majority of the hits in the ScanMax plots. And then the amino acid, the kinases with amino acid three or four at this position essentially did not show up as hits in this in the ScanMax plot. We did the exact same exercise for, for other series, obtaining very similar, very similar results. So at this point, we were really we were really excited because now we not only uh, reproduced the we not only understood this data qualitatively, but we also had a quantitative method, such as uh, using protein residue mutation FEP to to, to, ex to explain it quantitatively. This could actually be represented in a slightly different way where instead of looking in Delta PIC50 predictions, we can also put it on a scale of the absolute uh, predicted uh, binding affinity. And again, as I mentioned earlier, typically when we're thinking about optimizing the ligands or designing more potent uh, analogs, we typically would be looking for the compounds in this, in this range which have high predicted potencies. In order for us to, for the compound to have a selectivity, we actually were interested in retaining excellent levels of potency on their own target, but they needed to be predicted poorly in the surrogate kinases. So having a fully validated this method, um, we now decided to, 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 to use it prospectively. And uh, for the, to prioritize compounds into the synthesis, not only based on uh, protein, uh, not only based on the ligand FEP predictions on V1, which is on target, but also factor in the predictions for this protein residue mutation FEP as well. So the goal for this was uh, to quickly test this protein FEP hypothesis uh, pr prospectively quickly. So we gave ourselves an ambitious goal of doing it in the three months. Um, and, we, and the other stretch goal we set to ourselves is we would like to use this technology to even further improve our selectivity profile beyond the competitor molecules I showed you earlier. Uh, so before I go and talk about uh, how we gone around uh, the design and design profiling and prioritization of the compounds using those approaches, I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, the sub panel which we established with our bio, biology colleagues to be able to to be able to see the to, to be able to test this hypothesis very rapidly at our CRO without the need of sending every single compound for the discover X scanmax plot and then waiting uh, close to the months for the data to come back. So we really spent a bit of time and put a lot of thinking how we would like to set up a panel. So we ended up setting up a panel of 20 kinases. There was a number of requirements which we put into, into thinking how we would establish this uh, sub panel. The key one, as you can imagine, is that representative amino acids I talked about, those amino acids one to five, they needed to be fairly well represented across the kinome. And as you can see, we did a really good job uh, having a good representation there. We also wanted assays to be readily available at our CRO. Uh, and reliable to be able to do the quick reads on the compounds uh, in terms of their activities. 
Importantly, we also wanted to have fairly diverse locations on the kinome tree. We didn't want them to be within one family of, uh, of, the, of the kinases. So we also included some negative controls. Uh, those were the kinases which we knew are not hits or we not, didn't show up as hits in our, in our earlier charts, but we wanted to have them there as, an, as a negative control or the reference. Uh, so this table essentially represents a heat map. So these are the five series I showed you earlier. So we generated the data against all of the kinases. And as you can see, there is a lot of work uh, for us to do here. So even though the compounds were very potent on target, but the windows, when we calculate the window of selectivity to each of those kinases, and the percent of those kinases, is kinases in the subpanel was fairly low. So the best was 50%. And then you can see as low as 25. So a lot of the kinases were lit up uh, in this uh, subpanel. We were also really happy with these results because it qualitatively uh, very nicely represented the, those shotgun blasts of the scan mats, which I showed you earlier. So we're really comfortable with the selection that we can progress compounds coming from the synthesis uh, into the quick assessment of this hypothesis using this highly curated uh, kinase subpanel. So now having fully validated uh, the protein residue FEP, we essentially incorporated into the funnel. So we replaced our PLK1 off-target um, ligand FEP for uh, protein FEP simulations for those selectivity handles. We continue to rely on, again, our design, uh, design, design and uh, hand-drawn design as well as the numerations to feed into, into this funnel. I'll talk about it in a second, and you can probably appreciate that now the criteria became much more stringent uh, because we not only needed to meet the criteria on the on-target potency as predicted by ligand FEP on V1, which we always wanted to be at the high level, so this is in PIC50 values, but we also wanted to generate significant improvement in each of those five simulations. And uh, as you can imagine, this possesses a specific design challenge because now you, we need to essentially check a very stringent six boxes rather than just looking at one particular metric as on target potency. So it took us some time uh, to find a compound, what we call as a first generation compound, where we did not, we're not able to address all of the challenges. For example, amino acid one perturbation in protein FEP was still giving us challenge where we were not able to improve uh, on, on this on this metric significantly, but we did significantly better on all other three on, a, on all other four amino acids. So we were comfortable moving this compound on the synthesis queue as quickly as possible. It was fairly easy compound for make, and we thought that it's a great proof of concept uh, for for this protein FEP hypothesis. So we did not stop um, there. So we continued our design uh, design and profiling effort which is eventually culminated on identification of two more compounds. So the second compound arrived, which was still very potently predicted on target. Now, essentially we had dialed out all other liabilities in amino acid one, three, four, and five, completely to their high, very high level. There was only one interesting liability where in amino acid two, we actually made this somewhat worse. So when we were doing the change for amino acid two, we were predicting gain of potency for those types of uh, kinase is represented by amino acid two. So nonetheless, this was an interesting profile for us to test the hypothesis. So this also went in the synthesis queue. And eventually we were successful in the, and we were successful in designing compound, which met all of the criteria uh, we established for this program. So it was still very potently predicted on target and that we dialed out all of the liabilities in the protein FEP. Again, I just want to highlight, this is the Delta PIC50 values. So the large negative number means that we were losing, that we were losing significant amount of potency in the context of those surrogate kinases represented with this amino acid change at the, at the, at the residue X. So we were really happy with this result. So I mentioned that this is essentially a design challenge so that it took several rounds of ideation and profiling to be able to arrive to this exciting compound. This is just a little bit of a metric. So we profiled about 7,500 ligands and then some percent of it progressed into the protein residue mutation FEP. So this was a very exciting day when the synthesis of the first generation compound was completed. And uh, we tested it in uh, on-target uh, uh, potency in, uh, in our V1 uh, 
ADP glow assay. So here is the so we were able to, to essentially retain and improve slightly on the on the target as predicted by ligand FEP. But what was even more exciting that we significantly improved on the selectivity profile with just one round of synthesis and testing. So as you can see that we essentially drove all this fold windows as it relates to the V1 activity against all of the kinases with only two of them now um, showing less than 100 fold window. So this was very exciting. And then we were patient, patiently waiting for the data to arrive from the Discover X for the ScanMax plot. And in this case, uh, I'm, I'm sure the picture is worth a thousand, wall, uh, thousand words. So we saw significant improvement on the broader kinome profile as well, as shown by this graph here. Uh, it also can be um, observed more numerically. If we look at the selectivity score of S35, S10, and S1, so we were really happy that while our first generation compound, we already uh, accomplished significant improvement in this profile. I would highlight, uh, though, that in this case, uh, we did sacrifice uh, some of the PLK1 uh, selectivity. Um, we knew at this point of the program, we had a really good handle how to how to be able to how to have this uh, selectivity under control. So we knew that there is a clear path forward now that we knew that the protein FEP hypothesis is working really well. So then a few few months later, a few weeks later, we started getting data for the second generation analogs. So the second compound arrived next. And as you can see from its, its profile, so essentially it maintained the potency on the own target in our ADP glow assay, again, consistent with what we've been predicting in silico. But what was more interesting in this case, we essentially pushed the selectivity to the new level. There is only a few kinases which were coming back with a windows of uh, less than a uh, thousand in this case. So essentially having 100% kinase with at least 100 fold window in the sub panel. So these two compounds arrived earlier uh, and that really gave us confidence to continue push, pushing ahead with the third compound because third compound possess certain synthetic challenges for us. But now that we gain confidence how well ligand FEP and protein FEP really work together to improve uh, the selectivity profiles, we remain committed uh, to making the third compound as well, which essentially was meeting all of the stringent criteria. So this effort was very well worth, uh, was very well worth our uh, commitment there because once we obtain this compound, we not only retain beautiful potency on the one target, again, consistent with prediction on V1 FEP, but now we push selectivity profile to, to the new levels. So essentially every single kinase here pretty much was about 5,000 fold window. As you can imagine, there was another several weeks of uh, impatient waiting to get the, the scan max plots back uh, for this uh, second generation analogs. And it was very consistent with what we observed in the, in the, in the sub panel. So we significantly improved on the selectivity profiles and in case of the third analog, we essentially generated almost exquisitely selective uh, V1 inhibitor, retaining excellent activity on target, uh, comparing to where we started. And then more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, at this point, we were really, we had a really good idea how to dial out PLK1 uh, potency. So both of these compounds uh, showed no activity at all uh, on this off target. Again, this, uh, this uh, selectivity plots uh, very nicely translate into the numerical improvements when we look at the S35, S10, or S1. So this was a was very successful uh, and exciting day for us on the program. So this uh, essentially brings us uh, to the conclusion of my presentation. So I just would like to summarize briefly. Uh, hopefully I was able to show you the flow. Uh, we typically flow for this particular program but it does apply to a number of programs uh, we run at uh, within the drug discovery group at Schrodinger, where we rely on the various sources of ideation and design, starting from collecting it from all of the members of the team to different um, enumeration techniques to supplement it. And then depending on the particular needs of the program, we can establish uh, different uh, profilings where we just rely on the ligand FEP, or in this case, we incorporated the protein residue mutation FEP into this funnel to really be able to quickly uh, generate a novel chemical matter and then very quickly optimize it, uh, the selectivity profile using uh, these two methods to really get something which uh, made us all very excited, excited and move the program to the new level. Uh, with this, I'd like to uh, 
acknowledge uh, a large number of people who were involved in this program, not only from the drug discovery group uh, and the immediate project team, but at uh, Schrodinger, we work very closely cross-function, uh, for example, in this case with the development uh, colleagues who help us improve uh, these methods and uh, tweak them to the proper, tweak them and uh, teach us how to do the proper application uh, on the drug discovery, drug discovery programs. I would specifically like to uh, thank Anthony Clark and Jennifer Knight, who were uh, two people behind the protein FEP hypothesis. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, without uh, generating that hypothesis, uh, the fate of this program could be very different from uh, where, where we've got. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I will be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks for that, Alexi. Um, there was a great deal of information in there. Um, just a reminder to everybody who's here, we'll send you a copy of the webinar in the next few days. Um, but now on to some questions and we've had some, some really great, great questions in. Um, okay, let me kick off. And so, this is from Shima, um, who said, thanks for your interesting talk. You mentioned that many FEP plus calculations performed and turned into finding off-target kinases. To do so, were the complex structures homology modeled? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Uh, so actually, no. So the way the protein FEP works is we actually don't utilize, this is the power of protein FEP. So we are not using the any homology model or any 3D structures for all of those 400, I'll say, for the kinase which we identified as hits. We basically generated a hypothesis where we said we can reproduce this uh, result with changing a single residue within uh, V1 kinase itself at the particular position. So we actually using the V1 as the template and then we change in just one particular strategic residue which we identified to the other residue. So once we do that in silico, we're just saying that the, once we do the change, this is now a surrogate kinase. It doesn't actually exist as it is because we only changed one residue. But we made an assumption based on the analysis that by doing this change and just estimating the, the, the difference in the binding affinities, this could be a surrogate. So this is where the difference came. So alternatively, if you would have thought about utilizing the structure for every kinase which was a hit, you can imagine that then we would have needed to do it for hundreds of hundreds of different kinases. Some of them might not necessarily have a crystal structure. So we just took an opposite approach. So we analyzed the data and we just narrowed it down to five simulations. So we essentially were relying on five simulations which were used as a surrogate to represent a large panel of uh, hits in our scan exploits. So this is the way the protein FEP technology works in general. Hopefully that answers the asked, question. <laughs> and they also asked, how do you identify those re residues around the binding site that have specific impact on binding? Yes, yeah, so I don't think I can go as, yes, yeah, you can imagine. So I wasn't able to show a lot of the structures and also reveal the identities of those amino acids. So I don't think I can quite answer that question, uh, sorry. At some point, we'll be we will hopefully be able to uh, to present more details on on the on the approach itself. Fantastic. So we've got a question from Edgar. Do you think this method could replace docking in structure-based drug design? Yeah. So that's another excellent question. I think in general, um, FEP technology definitely provides by far more accurate predictions than docking. So I think we published a number of papers now just comparing the, let's say, docking scores when um, we compare a subset of the designed ligands and how it correlates to the experimentally observed binding affinity. So what we typically see is with docking, you can in certain cases enrich for, let's say, uh, for, for the compounds which have some level of potency on target from ones which are completely inactive. But it just doesn't give you the resolution. Uh, the docking itself doesn't give you the resolution of what FEP technology allows you to do because FEP technology really gives you the accurate number, which now not just uh, categorical, but it's very accurate in the prediction. And when it's deployed appropriately, it comes close to the experimentally measured values, which can be correlated to binding affinity. 
So we do use docking in the earlier. So I mentioned when we generate large number of ligands, right? So in this case, I showed an example where we designed close to 7 million ligands. We would rely on uh, in, a certain, in the certain stages when we prioritize compounds for the FEP predictions, because we still cannot quite run them in the million compound scale. So we do need to rely on the faster techniques to, to choose the subset of compounds. So that's where docking comes into play. We really use it as a filter, but we don't use it as a method to, to predict potencies uh, accurately or quantitatively. We really do it using the FEP. It's much more powerful method because again, it takes into the account all of the aspects of binding. Unlike docking, which is very rigid, it doesn't have the water molecules in it. The FEP takes into the account the dynamics of the protein, all of the water energetics, as well as the conformational aspects of the ligand. Fantastic. So we've got a question from Ali. Have you ever tried computational optimization tools such as genetic algorithms in your projects? It's a good question, and I don't think I don't think we did. Uh, so I'm definitely curious uh, to learn what those techniques are. I don't think we did, so, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, and um, another one. Um, after we get the best ligand for specific receptors using in silico analysis, um, they say they've got a problem for how to, with how to synthesize that ligand. So their question is, um, is there any software that can predict the pathway of the synthesis or retro synthetic analysis? Yes, yeah, so this is this is an excellent question. So I think there is uh, there is a number of uh, now approaches which are being used, essentially using the machine learning methods to trying to essentially replace the to replace the the the, the, the work organic chemists typically do, trying to think how to make it retro uh, how to make that retro synthesis. In our particular case, we did not rely on any techniques uh, like that, but uh, those are definitely in development uh, to be able to guide um, to guide uh, the synthesis or, or synthesis planning for that. Uh. So we do have ways we can incorporate. So maybe something I, I didn't mention earlier. So we do have a way to incorporate synthetic tractability. In, so I mentioned uh, one of the um, tool we utilize as other designer. So in, in that particular workflow of the other designer, there is, a, there is a method which is implemented such as a synthetic tractability. So to, to essentially predict how tractable this compound would be because we can go after a large number of ligands, but we need to have some idea that at least it's tractable synthetically. So great question overall. I think we'll see a lot more of uh, application of uh, machine learning specifically technologies to really help us in sense of the retrospective uh, or retro um, retro, retro analysis for synthesis. Okay, so um, how do you incorporate synthetic feasibility into your compound selection funnel when you're exploring such a large chemical space as you described? Yeah, so this is an excellent question and something which I really like to touch on. So we, so the typical workflow. So if we don't have, well, if we don't, let's say, so I worked on the programs where I couldn't uh, in my previous in my previous company, the programs which I couldn't really rely on the power of FEP to be comfortable with the predicted levels of potency, that possesses a challenge. Then depending on the compounds which were designed, then you always, you almost always gravitate into making compounds which are easier to make because there was no other way to tell which one will be more potent than the other. So they do all make sense from medicinal chemistry intuition. They make sense from uh, knowledge of the SAR, but you very typically find yourself when you don't have a power of pred predictivity power from in silico methods, just making compounds which uh, can be made easier uh, because there is no other way to prioritize them. It's very different uh, for the programs where we can fully deploy FEP because as I highlighted with this uh, third generation analog, we were comfortable to take on fairly complex uh, chemistry because we, we had a really good rationale why it's such an exciting compound. So what we're finding ourselves very often at uh, programs at Schrodinger we are willing to take on more complex chemistry more frequently just because we're using um, these methods such as an FEP to really filter out compounds which are not promising. Even if it, so we typically have a good balance. We would be taking compounds which validate the hypothesis quickly because we do need to see that the predictions we see in silico are real. 
So that's an important aspect, but then we typically don't shy away from the complex chemistry. And that's essentially what we really find is another power of using these tools to get ourselves into the new chemical space, just taking on more complex uh, synthesis and be very selective with those compounds. So we would take, I guess in short, maybe that we don't necessarily shy away from the complex synthesis if there is a good rationale from in silico methods to go after those compounds. Okay, so a question from Pablo. How influential is the initial ligand binding pose in the accuracy of the FEP calculation? Is it only recommendable yes. for experimentally determined complexes or can it be useful for complexes generated through docking? This is a really excellent question. So we have the best confidence from the get-go if you have the compound co-crystallized. So that would be the preferred preferred starting pose for the ligand to do all of the simulations. Having said that, uh, we've been successful in uh, using docking or, uh, or more, even uh, more advanced methods uh, such as induced feed uh, docking, IFDMD, that's the other method that we developed at Schrodinger. So typically when we use the, this method such as docking or uh, induced feed docking methods, uh, what we generally follow up that uh, process with is we need to have some retro, some experimental data or SAR information for the congeneric set of ligands. We would like to validate that the binding mode predicted using those methods reproduces the publicly or available SAR information. So we're using retrospective FEP. I mentioned that earlier that this is actually the part of the proper deployment of the FEP technologies, making sure that if you have if you have historic information or you have public information on the SAR, preferably with a large dynamic range, that you can recapitulate, recapitulate it with either starting from the crystal pose or if you generated the binding mode using other methods, that what you've known already about SAR is reproducible. So if you can do that, and we have multiple examples where we are successful applying FEP using the docking poses or induced fit docking poses, but it does require an extra level of validation, but it absolutely can be done. So Thomas asks, can FEP calculations be used with metalloenzymes? Another excellent question. So uh, a great question because as you as you can imagine, there is a force field which is, uh, which is behind this FEP simulation, so which takes into the account certain uh, certain assumptions. So we are not solving the Schrodinger equation in an absolutely quantum mechanical way accurately. There are certain assumptions which go into the force field. So Schrodinger invested heavily in the continuous development and improvement of the force field by virtue of working on the large number of uh, targets, whether on the large number of targets as I demonstrated earlier. So the metals within the uh, protein structure possesses a certain challenge because those will need to be parameterized separately in the force field. So we have, have, we have been successful, so it is a challenging task, so it takes an FEP to the new level, but we have been successful applying this technology to the metalloenzymes. There is uh, certain, um, certain characteristics or certain ways how the FEP needs to be uh, applied in those, in those cases, but it can be done with the same levels of accuracy. We've been successful on some internal programs and collaborative programs on uh, metal enzymes but great question because it does require an extra level of attention when those simulations are occurring so great question and Pazan asks what if we don't know the binding site well and how can this method um, be used for simulations like that mm, so if you don't know the binding so I guess so if it if there is no crystal structure um, and that, and that's the reason why we don't know that the binding side of binding mode, one could imagine, I talked about potentially using IFD, MD or docking to actually find the binding pose. If you have a crystal structure, if there is no crystal structure, even let's say APO uh, structure, one could think about, uh, let's say, developing a homology model from the highly homologous uh, protein and then using this homology modeling plus the docking approach or IFD approach to generate the binding mode. But by doing that, now you just need to realize the kind of a risks or uncertainties which could be associated with this approach because homology model uh, itself comes with uncertainties. Then you kind of 
bringing the other aspect of the docking uncertainties or induced fit docking uncertainties. So you will really need to have a um, very good set to validate this methodology retrospectively. So you would need to have a pretty good set of SAR to be able to do it retrospectively before you will start thinking about, you know, prioritize, prioritizing, prioritizing your, your own designs. Because if you cannot recapitulate the historic data, you, it's probably unlikely that it's going to work prospective. So it just pushes the this technology to the next to, to it just it just becomes more complex to apply this technology. One could try it, and then in, in certain circumstances we would we could go after such approaches. But just expectations that this will work as easily as you know cases I, I talked about where you have the crystallized ligand with the structure. In those cases, the applicability could be by far more out of the box than when you don't know, when you don't have the APO structure and you don't know the binding mode. And Alexi, what kind of hardware is required for running protein FEP calculations? And can the same FEP plus licenses be used to run protein FEP? Yeah, so that's uh, another great question. So typically FEP simulations are run on the uh, GPUs, so the graphical processing units, not the CPUs, like typically when, when we think about let's say docking and some other methods, those were typically done with the CPU power. So FEP simulations or a lot of the molecular dynamic simulations in general are now run on the graphical processor units, uh, uh, which, which allows for the significant acceleration and running them at a scale. And uh, the, the one of the biggest uh, advantages for us in the pharmaceutical industry being able to apply this uh, in silico methods is actually uh, advances in the gaming industry. Those led to the improvements of the GPU units, which now can be applied, you know, for, for the other applications beyond beyond gaming. In terms of the licenses, uh, it's the same if the same FEP licenses which uh, which can be used for the ligand FEP can also be used for the protein residue mutation FEP. And, and Mark asks, have cryo EM structures been evaluated in the FEP space? Yeah, that's another excellent question. Uh, yes, so depending on the quality of the cryom structure, it's absolutely can be applied, which it's absolutely can be used in the FEP simulations. So there is certain aspects of resolutions of the cryom structure, uh, the way the, the the way the resolution is reported. So at some at a certain resolution of the cryom structure, it can absolutely be um, applicable for the for the FEP simulations. But you would typically still be looking at the structures around three angstrom resolution and there are certain aspects of the cry m structure in particular um, how the resolution is determined but uh, generally the answer is yes and i think the expectation in general that cry m uh, methodology will continue to improve very rapidly over uh, next uh, next several years or decades so we're going to see a lot more application of uh, fep to the crime structures. There is no limitation uh, why that shouldn't be possible at the proper resolution. And another question from Pablo. Um, how large can the perturbations in the R group of a molecule be? Is the computational cost the only limiting factor or are there other physical reasons limiting how much you can perturb? Yeah, so another excellent question. So it's uh, typically case by case basis. This is again the part of this uh, proper retrospective validation. So we typically, in general, as a rule of thumb, uh, for the normal size small molecule, we typically would like to keep the number of heavy atoms which are being perturbed at once less than 10. Um, and again, at that end, but it's more comes to to case by case basis. So if you see in some, in, if you see that you can do, you know, larger changes and reproduce, let's say, historic data or retrospective data, that's great, then you can do much larger perturbation. In certain cases, depending on the depending on the particular target to target class or its uh, flexibility, for example, it could be much smaller changes. But typically, I would say at this point, and you can also, uh, regarding the cost of the calculations, now that this actually keeps coming down, one could imagine using the larger number of what's called lambda windows, which allow you to do the more accurate predictions for changing a large number of heavy atoms. But I would say anywhere from five to 10, we have done successfully and robustly on the number of programs, which is significant part of uh, the molecule where we would be doing the design, so. Okay, and last question. Um, can FEP 
can protein FEP technology be applied to other protein targets? Yeah, excellent. Another excellent question. I think there is no fundamental limitation of the technology. So I think there are several publications we uh, published in the field how the protein FEP could actually be applied broadly to some other to some to to, to some other um, for, for to solving some other scientific challenges. So I just welcome uh, to look at some of the publications we've done in the space. But yes, it, it, it should, there should absolutely be no limitation. It's a technology with the right application could be applied broadly. Wonderful. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much to everybody for attending. You'll see an exit survey when this uh, um, webinar ends and also receive it by email. So please do fill that in as it helps us gauge what you'd like to see more of in the future. And so we can really tailor these webinars to your needs. If you have any further questions, then please drop us an email at cwwebinars at rsc.org. We don't make the slides available because we feel the really important thing is to have the slides in context with the presentation from our speaker, but we do make the entire recording available and that will be sent to you soon. Our next webinar with Schrodinger is on the 25th of February. That webinar is titled High Throughput Reaction Screening for Accelerated Materials Research. And you should be able to see the link to that in the chat box now. So once again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Alexi, um, Executive Director of Medicinal Chemistry at Schrodinger. Um, and Schrodinger were our partners for this webinar and they will be our partners for more webinars this year. Based on the number of questions we've had, this was clearly a topic of interest um, and we're delighted to have worked with Schrodinger on this webinar. That's the end. I'm Jennifer Newton and this was a Chemistry World webinar. See you again for the next one.